I am Dr. Papazov Svetlana, how people know me, and I am the lead pastor of Real Life Church. You're listening to us online, and we just want to tell you we are fully online, and yes, church can exist fully online. We actually also gather in a Zoom group at this point, and we are a community of believers who activate each other's faith to bear witness to God in the marketplace. And we come from different states and different places, and we invite you, if you do not have a place where you're searching to understand the Word of God, and you want to be activated into your faith, if you don't have a place like that, come on, join us. We will give you a Zoom link because that's how you become uh, part of Real Life Church and how you can begin to belong. I am excited for what God has put in my heart to share with you today. We're beginning a new series called What's in Your Hand? And I believe this is a fresh word for now. Although we're just going to really go and read from one of the oldest book in the Bible. The Bible has the canon that has been accepted and embraced by the historical church, it has 66 books, and we're going to actually read today from Exodus. Um, again, one of the oldest writings in the Holy Scriptures, yet it is one of the freshest word of God to us today. You will find that the context I'm going to be reading about will talk about how a whole nation becomes politically infamous, socially oppressed, and even their survival is on the line. So much happening, and especially about the newborns, their life was on the line. And if you think that some of those issues are actually a 21st century issues. I have news for you because, as I said, we're reading that from the Old Testament, and it is millennia old. It is not a 21st century. It's not a contemporary issue. It is a human hearts issue. And the, the humanity always wrestles with the same issues of the heart. We repeat them again. We have tendency to not learn from the lessons that we see in history. And we make our own history by repeating the same, the same problems. And God is right now speaking to us, saying, come on, come into my presence. You will find a miraculous way, a turnaround from the circumstances that you are experiencing. So I just want to encourage you, uh, if you're watching right now, to share this link, invite somebody else to also watch so we can all be encouraged toward God's miraculous transformation in our lives. We will read today from Exodus and... Um, if you have your hard copy ready, you can open it or you can have your smartphone and download the Bible app if, if you um, don't have handy your Bible, but you can read and follow uh, the Word of God. And we're going to read from Exodus chapter 3 and we will jump to chapter 4 as well, but I'm going to fill in uh, as we are talking about this, you know, what's being written in chapter 1 and 2. Uh, I have asked a church in the Zoom group to actually come prepared to have read Exodus 1 to 4, because it is an amazing time that I believe a lot of the elements are being repeated right now in 20. 22, 21st century, uh, millennia later. So Exodus 3, verses 7 to 10, and then we will go to Exodus 4, verses 1 to 3, and then we will also read verse 5. So again, if you have your scripture ready, it's in Exodus chapter 3. The writings are divided in chapters, so, so it has a heading that says chapter 3. If you reading from your Bible app the same way. You go to the books of the Bible, it says Exodus, and then you can click on chapter 3, verses 7 to 10, and then chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, and then verse 5. Let's go ahead and read and understand what God is speaking. Then, 
and what God is speaking now. Because remember, we talked about good hermeneutics, how we apply the scripture of God to our lives today, because although it's written um, maybe in, in some cases a couple of thousand, three thousand years um, before, but it is fully applicable, fully being activated today. If we can appropriate the prop properly apply it to our circumstances today, what's proper hermeneutics? We need to understand first, what is God speaking to the first reader? We need to grasp this, and then we build a bridge between their circumstance then and then our circumstance now. And when we see the similarities, then whatever is true for then, it's true for now. Because God is the same God. He doesn't change. His word remains the same. So that's how we apply the word of God. Let's go ahead and read it. <clears throat> the Lord is having a conversation with Moses. Moses was depressed, anxious, and fearful. He ran for his life and hid in the desert. And he finds himself now in the desert, running from a palace. He grew up uh, as an educated prince in the Egyptian palace. He was mighty, respected, yet he got himself in trouble. He killed someone and he ran from punishment and he finds himself in the desert and he now tends sheep. He tends a flock and in his hand, he is holding a staff, a shepherd's hook, a rod. And as he is walking in the desert, he finds himself, I don't know if subconsciously he wanted to go in that place. I don't know that. But I know that as he was tending the ship, as he was depressed, because the verses before that tells us that he was so depressed that he names the firstborn child that he has with a very depressing name, an alien, you know, somebody that, that's foreigner, that's not known, that doesn't have a place to belong. That the name he gives to his firstborn and in that depressive state in that anxiousness he finds himself at the place where God shows up he goes to the mountain of God and I know that a lot of you today are anxious depressed and you have been it feels like in a desert for far too long the whole world has been in a desert for many reasons, but several main ones, and one of them a global pandemic. And we've been in a desert with a lot of death happening around us. And we've been walking around and somehow, maybe subconsciously now, we're beginning to cry out and say, God, save us. God, we need a meeting with you. We need true transformation. And this is where Moses finds himself at the foot of the mountain where God shows up at the mountain of God. And he sees God burning in his circumstance in a bush that doesn't, that doesn't uh, die the fire in that bush. And he goes to check that out. And God begins a conversation with him. I just want to encourage you, my friend. God wants to begin a conversation with you today and to address your depressed state and your desert. When you go to God, God addresses your circumstance and there is fire in your desert by the presence of God. Here we go. Exodus 3 verses 7 to 10 says this. The Lord said, to Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites. And you're saying, what whites? What, what ites? Let me tell you, when God speaks to you, he's very detailed. He, he's absolutely always in, in real time, in real geography. It's not something somewhere, somehow, maybe, when. No, it is now, it's present, and it's in, in real geography. And he's saying, I have heard the cry of your people. Just put yourself, I always do that. I, I try to put myself in the action. Because remember, good hermeneutics is to understand what's happening then. And then you build your bridge to what's happening now. So put yourself in Moses' shoes. And Moses had ran away from Egypt, ran away from his people that rejected him. Moses wanted to help them to be liberated from the Egyptian yoke, from the Egyptian slavery, but they didn't take his liberation tactics. He went in, he was too aggressive, he killed a couple of people, one Israelite, one Egyptian, and they said, who made you the ruler of us? Just back off, back off, we don't like you. So he runs away and he's in the desert, depressed with no hope for his future. And God meets him in the midst of that circumstance, in the midst of that journey of depression and anxiety that Moses is on. What would go through your mind at this time? Would you say, really, God, you couldn't show up when I was in the palace, when I was this mighty influential prince, now you come in the desert to tell me you want to liberate them? What about me? I mean, God always, when he speaks, he gives you the big picture of the vision of the body that you belong to, because we don't do life by ourselves. We're always a part of a body. And Moses understands that he's a part of this nation. He's a part of the whole. So God is talking about the whole, but Moses is removed from the whole. And God is giving him a vision. I'm going to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land and gives him the geography. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So until now, Moses is like, so what? I mean, yeah, I know the Egyptians were oppressing them when I was there and I, I tried. They didn't believe me. They didn't follow me. So here they are even more oppressed. Sometimes we're like, yeah. That's what they deserve. They deserve even more because like they didn't listen to my leadership. They didn't agree with me. They didn't align with me. They deserve that. Wouldn't you know, God places him right back in the leadership saddle. But this time, Moses had to follow God in order to lead others. So God says to Moses, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Whew. So what if you were a voice in a wilderness and you're just calling out and saying, hey, culture, you know, things are going uh, haywire around me and we need to do this and we need to do that. And you strategized and you even pushed through hard and you went after certain things. And instead of getting better, it got worse. Instead of you gaining political popularity, you, become, you became politically infamous. And maybe even your whole body, maybe even your church, maybe those that you belong to became politically infamous because that's exactly what happened to the Israelites and to Moses. He's now outside of the Pharaoh palace and he has no influence politically to do anything about it, to liberate this nation. And in addition to it, regardless of how Moses thought that he can influence the social oppression that his people were uh, being uh, entrenched and abused by, you know, because he would go and he would watch how the Egyptians beat them and abuse them, you know, and, and he just rebelled, couldn't, couldn't stand that. And, and in his anger, he even killed the oppressor. 
one of them. <laughs> and and God is saying, you did it all wrong. And the people really pushed back at you because your strategy is not my strategy. You know what? A lot of times we, we want to do a, a good thing in the world with the wrong strategy. Because we are not really following the strategy of God. So Moses answers because he's thinking, I'm politically infamous and I and my people are socially oppressed and I tried to help and they didn't listen to me. So Moses answers to God, what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say the Lord didn't appear to you? See, Moses goes back in his head to his previous experience. This is exactly where we go. When God tells us to follow him and to go in the direction he's leading us, we immediately go back in our minds to our previous experience. And in our minds, what we replay is the old strategy about doing something good, but with the wrong strategy. So in his mind, you know, these pictures are being played and he's saying, they're going to push back at me, God, because what if they say, what are you talking about? You were here and, and, and you did it the wrong way. And we don't want to follow you because we don't believe that God really showed, showed himself to you. Then the Lord said that to him. And this is, this is what I entitled the entire series. And we're going to camp a little bit with that today is just the beginning. I'm just giving you a foretaste and I'm going to give you a homework at the end because I really want you to read these chapters, Exodus first, uh, second, third, and fourth chapter, read them, read them, read them, and begin to understand the circumstance then and your circumstance now. And this question that God asked Moses, he is asking you today. He says, what is that in your hand? God is saying to Moses, when Moses pushes back and says, people are not going to believe me. I met with you. People are not going to believe me. You gave me direction for uh, the next season of life. People are not going to believe me that I can be an influencer for good because I've done a lot of influence, but it was for bad in the past. I didn't do well. My, my life is not right. Why on earth would people believe me that you are leading me now and I will be following you? And God is saying, what's in your hand? What is this thing in your hand? And, and I don't know about you, but like Moses probably is doing this and it's like, oh, this thing? Oh, this is nothing. I just cut it from this tree, you know, like in the desert, you know, like these craggly bushes and stuff. It's a branch. Because when you, when you read the translation, it's a rod. It, 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 it's a branch, basically. You just cut it and, and then you just kind of protect the sheep around or you just strike the sheep if they go to the left or to the right. You know, he's like, what? This thing? This is nothing, God. What do you mean? You're asking me now? What do I have in my hand? Why didn't you ask me then? See, then when I was in palace, in the palace, Josephus, by the way, it's a historian uh, it, it, that wrote about um, the nation of Israel, says that Moses was a handsome, very well-educated prince and was a mighty warrior on behalf of the Egyptians. And so as a mighty warrior, what Moses would have had in his hand pretty much all the time is a spear and a very good one at that with which he can fight and he can win wars and he can liberate people with a spear, with a rod. Come on, God, you could have asked me then, then I had something in my hand of value, of substance, of sophistication, complex thing that is specifically crafted for the purpose you're calling me to accomplish. Now, it's kind of like a missed opportunity, God. Now, I don't have that. I only have like this branch I cut from, the, from, from a shrub, from a scraggly bush somewhere because I'm in a desert. And I, I only have what I can get. And in my hand, I only have a rod, a stick. Friend, what do you have in your hand? Is that what it looks like to you? See, 
the season then always looks better than the now. I hear so many adults and, and the elderly that they always reminisce for the season then. Oh, when we were young, things were so good. Or when we were there, and, and then when they start telling the crazy stories they did, I'm like, yeah, you, you were kind of like the now, but like it, in a different way, right? Your strategies of craziness were just a little bit different, but basically the same human heart. So, but, but somehow the then for us, that season, then, seems always better than the now season. The now season is always a, a season that has a lot of change, a lot of obstacles, a lot of difficulty, a lot of pain. Why? Because you and I are right here on this side of heaven. We go through life and life is like that. All life is like that. I mean, there isn't a you know, one part that completely is freed of pain, of challenge, of obstacles. But the thing is that where pain is, there is purpose. And where is there is challenge, there is change. And where there is obstacle, there is opportunity. It's about who you release what you hold in your hand to. Because a lot of times when we utilize what we have in our hand, in the strategy that we think is best, then the pain continues, the challenge continues, the obstacle continues. But when we release it into the hand of God, because this is what God says. Moses says, a staff, a rod, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground, release it, release it, release it, release it. And when we release what we hold on to for dear life, because that's exactly what Moses was holding on to this staff, to this rod, to this branch for dear life, because when he's attacked by wild animals, then he can just protect himself for dear life. But God is saying, throw it down and see what I am going to do with it. And God is saying right now to you and me, what's in your hand? You think that whatever is in your hand is insignificant and the season I'm calling you to release it into me is past, is unimportant. It's too challenging. <laughs> but God is saying to us, watch me work. Because if it's up to us, we will have God work in a season that things seem possible or at least plausible. At least the possible or plausible. But the thing is, God is not a possible God. God is an impossible God. God takes absolutely everything that you and I are seeing as impossibility, as a challenge, as an obstacle, and he takes it into an opportunity. He changes it for his miraculous purpose and his transformation never, ever, ever looks like the change you and I were going to bring in the world. He brings his transformation from the inside out and the things never look the same. He completely changes what happens in our world. What he did with the Israelites, he takes them out. I'm challenging you, read the whole book of Exodus. He takes them out and he positions them to be from nomads, from immigrants to landlords. From nomad who just goes from one place to another, from an immigrant in Egypt and from a nomad in the desert as they're traveling toward liberty, to actually a landlord, to a possessor of their own geography and place. And that is an amazing transformation. Nothing from the past remains. It is a totally brand new pattern of living and this is what God wants to do in your life and in my life he wants to bring a different pattern of life he wants to make you from an immigrant and uh, an alien that doesn't belong because you may have a geographical uh, or a stamp on the passport you know a geographical place you call your land your place but what if in your heart you feel like you don't belong 
But God is saying, but I am making everything new and I can bring you into a community with myself and your brothers and sisters and you would feel like you belong and you would be an owner and not a renter anymore. You will see a new pattern of influence in the world. And my friend, today in the world, so many of us feel like we're politically infamous for one reason or another. And let me tell you, I know I speak from the USA, but like I'm speaking to a global audience right now. And in the politically, in so many countries, there are so many political systems and groups that fight and feel like nomads or aliens and they don't belong and they have become infamous. God is the true leader of all parties, of all groups of people. And he is saying, coming to me, seek the mountain of God. Let me burn in your circumstance because when I burn in your circumstance, in the burning bush, then I transform it fully. But in order for me to transform it fully, throw what's in your hand, even if it's totally insignificant in your eyes. And even if you think the season is totally wrong because now, Yesterday, you were influential. Now, you're not. You're politically infamous. It doesn't matter. God transforms everything and makes it new. Or you might be thinking, but I'm, I'm socially oppressed. Let me just read you uh, the couple of three verses here that pertain to Moses. Politically infamous. No favor for the Israelites or for Moses from the political leadership. Because Exodus 1, 8 says... Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. So it, the power people might have changed, but God remembers you. The people over you may not pay attention to you, but God pays attention to you. And then socially oppressed, Exodus 1.11 says, so they put slave masters, the Egyptians, over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. And Exodus 1.14 says, they made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. So that was the now season. And Moses is thinking, but then was way better, God. You could have accomplished so much more if you talked to me then. <laughs> But God chooses, my friend, to talk to you now. Because then he may not have you here. Now, because of your circumstance, being so shaken up, now he gets Moses' attention. There is a burning bush, and Moses wants to go and see why is the fire not being quenched. Because when God burns in your circumstance, that fire continues and it transforms and brings a new opportunity in your place. And look at the third thing. Their whole future was endangered. Their very survival threatened. Their lineage was under suspension because all male children had to be killed at birth. This is the Egyptians so feared the Israelites that Exodus 122 says, Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw in the Nile, but let every girl live. So every boy had to be killed, including Moses. But do you know what his mother did? She held him in her hands and she came up with a strategy. For three months, she held on to her baby boy. But the thing is that our human strategy comes to an end when we can do only so much. And at the end of three months, when the boy gets too loud and, and, and gets um, to be known by the neighbors, that there is a, a newborn in that house, she could not hide him any longer. She had to let go reluctantly of what's in her hand. She let go of her human strategy of saving. And it's so interesting that then God, when she released what was in her hand, she put it in the, the Nile River in a basket and God turned the place of hostility 
into a place of protection. So a place of hostility that actually ordered the edict for all of these boys to be killed became a salvation place for the savior of the Israelites, that their very future was endangered by that edict. It is amazing what God does if we only release even the most precious thing that we hold. Moses, on one hand, was only holding a rod, a staff, a branch, and he probably thought, I don't have anything of value to give. Moses' mother held the most precious thing. She held a baby and she didn't want to release him, yet she did. But when God gets a hold of what you release from your hand into his hand on his timing, not on your time, on his timing, then he turns absolutely everything upside down and he turns every obstacle into an opportunity, every pain Oh my goodness, into a possibility for you and for those you love around you. So are you ready today, as God is asking you, what's in your hand, to let go of whatever you have at God's word, at his edict, and allow him to build his strategy for your opportunity. Let me pray over you. Father, we come before you, and I know you're challenging us in this season. What do we hold in our hand, and what are we holding on for dear life for? And you're saying, if you only release it into my hand, regardless of what you feel the season for you looks like, I can take every obstacle and turn it into an opportunity. I can take any pain and turn it into this amazing possibility because I'm the God of the impossible. And Father, we just pray right now that this is what you're going to give us boldness to do, to listen to you, to hear your word, and then to release the things we hold to and to give them for your transformation's sake, for your fire to come into our lives and to burn and to burn everything that's a dross and then the real gold will remain and you're going to purify us and you're going to purify the circumstances around us and you're going to make us influencers for your word because this is why you did that. You are doing all of that so your name will be glorified. This is what friends this is what God says to Moses, Exodus 4, 5. This said the Lord when he told him to release what's in his hand is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And friend, God is appearing to you right now. And when you release what you hold on, then he will transform it for his witness you will become a transformational witness so others would know the reality of god's power in their life as well thank you friends for watching share this word if it has been a blessing to you and we invite you to come and join us in our zoom group if you would like let us know and we would give you that link. But have a wonderful and blessed week and may the Lord bring miraculous fire in your midst this week. Release what you hold in your hands so you become a witness to a miraculous transformational God. Bye-bye, friends.